So welcome everyone. I, I know I have some front end developers in the room, yeah? Today we're gonna be talking about um, some UX tips and tricks, research techniques you can use. So even if your job title is not UX designer, you can still do UX, you still do, do UX. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name's Suzanne Dergachova. I've been doing Drupal for a while. This is my 21st DrupalCon and um, I spent a lot of time going around and talking about Drupal, and uh, I'm excited to be talking about UX today, actually. Uh, I'm on the board of the Drupal Association, and I also run a Drupal training program, so if you're into that, uh, come talk to me. Um, I'd love to, love to chat about Drupal training. So I'm here because I, I care about the human side of building digital. Um, I started out as a as a web developer coming from a, a music background. And um, I realized that I, I like hiding behind a laptop. I really like it. But I also like going out and talking to people. Um, and so bringing the user experience side to digital is, is a, a passion for me. And as we all spend more and more time on our screens, right, actually the experience that we're building for users becomes even more important. Because do people go around on their screens uh, and they're unhappy or they're happy, like we'd rather that they be happy, right? So just I wanted to start off by defining user experience. Um, every organization creates experiences. You create experiences all the time. You create an experience when someone comes in for an interview to your office or when you go and plan an event and invite people to an event, they, all, they have an experience. You're all having an experience right now here at DrupalCon. And when we talk about UX design, user experience design, we're, we're usually talking about building digital experience, which is just one piece of the puzzle. And that kind of fits into this rubric here. So we have an overall experience that we're creating, we're designing, uh, we're designing systems, we're designing customer experiences, and within there we, we obviously have a digital piece. We always have a digital piece. So that's that's where UX design lies. And then inside UX design, I mean, you're also designing visual elements. Um, and as front end developers, we often get caught up on these um, UI, smaller UI elements that go into the visual look of a digital experience. Um, but so UX is a little bit bigger than that. Um, it's more, it's more, um, it's larger than just uh, d design systems. Uh, in terms of like small button design, um, but it fits within a larger strategy of an organization. So building great user experiences is a great goal. We want to make people happy. We, we could make them happy really easily if we just you know, put videos of puppies and bunnies on, on our um, apps and websites. Um, so making users happy is not the goal of, of user experience uh, strategy. The goal is to find that intersection between what users want and what your organization or your business wants. Um, and I, I showed this slide yesterday at my uh, UX study talk. Um, I think this is really key. Um, asking the questions of the business, what are you trying to achieve, and asking the questions of the users, what do you really want? And uh, as front-end developers, we are often brought in at the stage where a lot of the UX decisions have already been made. And this is, this is the frustrating part, right? Anybody nodding here? Like, you come in, there's already a design, there's already, um, the, someone's already come up with the personas or the mock-ups, um, and, and maybe they forgot to ask these important questions. So I'm gonna run through, through some things today, and I'm gonna try and give you tools that you can use throughout the, throughout the design and build process, um, understanding that like as a, as a front end developer, you're not necessarily the one driving the whole process. So ideally you start off a project and you get to know um, what the business goals are. Every, every business, every organization has goals that they're trying to achieve. Um, and specifically goals that they're trying to achieve with their digital strategy. So sometimes the goals are really clear, right? Like you might, you might be working for an organization that has really obvious goals, like you're an airline, you need to get your customers uh, made to be, and you're trying to limit how much you spend, right? 
Um, sometimes goals are multifaceted because you have different audiences. You have different kinds of users, and you need to balance those goals. And then some of you, I know some of you work for organizations where the goals are really diverse, and it's actually really difficult to measure to measure the goals. So sometimes the goals are less driven around transactions and, and um, um, specific targets. Sometimes things are hard to measure, like you want to inform people, or you want to keep uh, the administrators at your big organization happy. Um, so that's just one side of the equation, the business side. Um, users are on the other side, right? So the other group of people we don't want to ignore here is who's actually going to be using these interfaces that we create? Who are the target users? So this is another important question to ask. So if you're starting on a project and someone passes you a set of wireframes or a set of mockups and they're like, oh, we're ready to go, you know, step back and maybe ask, like, okay, who are the target users? Let's do a, let's do a check here first. Um, and one thing that's actually a bit tricky about asking who are the users is, is prioritization. So a lot of times when you're building out a, a digital experience, you're, you want to make something that works well for everybody. You, you're trying to be inclusive, right? Um, and that's, that's a, a, a lot of a goal. But at the same time, you do have to prioritize. So often, um, if you ask, OK, who are our users, you might get back the response, well, everybody. We want everybody to buy our product. So um, it's, it's good to nail this down and to really say, like, no, really, who are we building this for? And, and which users are the most important? Because without that, it's, it's impossible to focus and, and build something that works well. So those are the, those are the questions you, you absolutely need to know the answers to. Um, and then from there, there's all kinds of UX techniques that you can use. So I'm going to go through a whole list of techniques. Um, I've never worked on a project where we've done all the things. So usually, user experience um, work, you're, you're doing what you have uh, time to do, what makes sense to do at this point in the process, um, what you have the money to do, because sometimes these things take money, um, and then also what, what makes sense, like what um, you, you need to kind of prioritize sometimes what research techniques you want to use just based on what problems you're trying to solve. So I'll run through a, a few things and try and give you that sense of what to use and when. So one of the easiest things that you can do um, is to send out a server to, survey to users, to the users that you want and the users that you have. Um, and it's easy to do a survey because it's just like a link that you send out to people, right? And you want to be thinking like, okay, who are, who are the most important users? Can I get them to fill in a survey? That, that's always um, a really helpful thing. You want to know um, a bit more about your users, like what their background is and what they're trying to achieve and what you can help them achieve. So obviously the questions in the survey, it's going to depend on what, what, you're, what you're looking for, but just getting that context of who these users are and what, what they want and what their prioritization is, that's really valuable. And that's going to help you prioritize your content and functionality that you're building out. Um, when you're getting a, when you're putting together a survey, obviously you need people to fill in the survey. There's lots of ways to recruit users. Um, even just telling users that their participation is valuable, this really helps convince convince people to participate, knowing that you're going to build them something better. So there's some key questions you might want to ask um, about what tasks they're performing, um, what they like, what's challenging, what they think can be improved. The tricky part about a survey is that sometimes the best questions to ask, there's not like a yes or no answer. So keep in mind when you're putting together a survey, if you ask 1,000 people a question and you get back 1,000 responses, if it's not, um, if you're getting back qualitative answers, it takes a really long time to fill in that survey. So a survey is easy to do until you start asking these open-ended questions. So when you ask what's challenging, um, if it's a if it's a multi um, if it's a multi-choice answer, it's going to be easy to process that result. If you just give them a big text area, you're going to have to go through and parse everything out. Um, sometimes when you do surveys, you might also do a first round that's a bit more open-ended, and then do a larger survey where you're asking a big group and you, you give them some choices based on what you've gathered in the first round. 
Another thing you can do that's a bit more in depth is uh, user testing. Um, now, user testing is great, like actually going and watching users use your, your interface, a website or an app. Um, but waiting until you've built out a prototype or until you've finished your project, um, it's, not, it's not always useful at that point, right? Often, like, you, can't, you don't have something to user test until you feel like you're almost on the project. So one way to get around this is to do uh, user testing with um, competitors' websites and tools. So you're probably already in the process of building out a project. You're probably already doing competitive research at some point. You're going out and figuring out, like, what are the other websites and apps that do something similar? So you can test those. You can, you can create a, a user test where you ask users to do um, these most important tasks that you've identified on your competitors' websites and just see how they do. And what you're looking for here is what works really well that your competitors do that you want to emulate and things that don't work well that you want to avoid. So you're looking for um, patterns, um, design patterns, labels, um, things people like that where they're able to succeed and things where um, people fail and, and have a bad impression of the interface. Um, and you can do that with your competitors' um, pro projects, but also with your own, right? If you have an existing um, website that you're redesigning, you can start off by doing user testing on the old platform. A card sort. Who here has ever participated in a card sort? Everyone loves a card sort because people really love sticky notes for some reason. <laughs> Which, which is great, because you can get people excited and get them involved. The best thing about a, doing a card sort workshop like this in, in person is that you, you get people who are involved in the project um, to feel a sense of ownership. So if you have time to do a card sort workshop, it doesn't take long, um, and it really helps not just with gathering information, but also making people feel like they're part of the process. Um, so how it works, or how, you know, there's many ways to run this, but how it could work is you get people into the room, representative users and stakeholders on the project, so people who care about, about the outcome, and get them to create sticky notes, and you can create them for them, um, with different aspects of what your, your website or your app are gonna include. So this could be content, tasks, um, it could be functionality, it could be content that you don't have yet that you think you might need to write. So all kinds of things that you think you're going to need to include. Um, and then the fun part is you get the, the users to organize these and to kind of sort them by what's related. So you find out in the room like who um, basically who thinks what's related to what, and sometimes arguments will break out. And these arguments are the most useful things. <laughs> so you'll have maybe one stakeholder um, wa wants to put a sticky note in one pile and another stakeholder wants to put them in another, and then you realize, oh, this is a, this is a conversation we need to have. Um, so usually the piles look way more messy than what you see on the right side there. Usually there's just these bundles and there's scribbles all over the, the, <laughs> the sticky notes. Um, and so it, you know, usually there's some processing you have to do afterwards and you figure out like, okay, we put all these things in this pile here. Um, they're all related to one section of the website, but what do we actually call that section? And like, what's the right label? And do we need all the sticky notes in here? Maybe some of them are not relevant. So there's definitely some work to do after the, the card sort workshop to you know, have a final result. You can also do card sort workshops online. So there's lots of different tools you can use to do this if you don't have everyone in the same place. But it's less fun and you don't get the arguments. <laughs> so uh, definitely do the workshop, um, in-person workshop if possible. So it's... Um, I guess it's your job, or if you're, you know, if you're working with other UX people, maybe it's somebody's job to take all those piles of sticky notes and to put them into some kind of archi information architecture. And that might be a sitemap um, or some kind of you know, plan for the architecture of your site. There's different ways to represent this. So having a plan that looks like this is, is great, um, but 
I think it's, it's a really valuable exercise to put this through the lens of user journeys. So once you have a plan for like what's, how is all, everything going to be organized on this, on this website and this interface, um, you want to actually go back to thinking through how different types of users are going to interact with, with this. So you go back to that question of who are our users, who are our most important users, and how are they going to go through this sitemap. So you can do exercises like fun ones like this where you draw the user journey out as a little cartoon, um, or you can just think it through. And then um, take that lens and put it on the sitemap. So actually walk through, um, walk through your interface kind of imagining that you are a user and um, kind of validate that this sitemap makes sense. And um, what, what I think is really effective is if you take note of which um, parts of this information architecture are being used by each persona. Um, and then you might find that there's some parts of the sitemap that nobody uses, none of your key personas, so then maybe you don't need those sections of the site. So that's a good way, like going through the key user journeys and um, taking that and applying it to your sitemap, you might be able to identify some content or some functionality that you don't need. And that's, that's exciting, right? Like if, if you don't have to build a section of your website, if it's not part of your um, you know, stuff that your key personas need, then your project suddenly got simpler. Okay, so you're taking all this information um, that you've gathered, like you've maybe done a survey, you've learned something about your users, you've figured out what they need in terms of the website, then you've tried to map it out into an architecture. Um, but then what you really, what you're th sitting there thinking is, yeah, but I'm a front end developer, so I care about like, you know, what, what button goes where, or like how, how this visually all fits together. Like you're, you're thinking a little bit more like tangibly what goes on each page, right? Um, and so it's important to think about what elements of the interface that you're build, building are influencing the user experience. So within, a, within the context of a page, you have things like the navigation, um, the emphasis you're putting on different elements and what you're calling things, um, and these have an impact as well. So it's not just having a user journey where the user goes from page to page, um, but actually within a page, there's a lot of things that are influencing the user experience. Um, so as you're building out wireframes, so how many of you here are building, creating wireframes? Some of you. How many of you use wireframes, like you look at wireframes and you're like, oh, I have to build that. Yeah, so things, <laughs> things that go, whoops, things that go uh, into wireframes have a huge impact on, on UX, right? But um, it's important to kind of think through perceptions uh, on the user's side. So even without doing user testing, there's a lot that you can do just through building empathy for your, th uh, building empathy for your users and thinking about what their expectations are. So in terms of how a user assesses their experience, they're affected by, by a bunch of things. Um, one thing that's often overlooked is time, timing, like how long something takes. So, as front-end developers, you know, we're, we're, we're impacting the performance and how we build things. And in some projects, performance is, is key. Um, predictability, do, does the user get what they expect? When they click on a button, you know, and they move to another page, like, are they surprised? So an element of surprise is, like, usually a bat. Usually you don't want surprises. <laughs> you want people to have a predictable interface. Um, people like simple things. Um, but the simplicity has to be commensurate with the amount of complexity that they're getting out of it. So if it's a really, you, you know, if they're um, buying a house, then maybe you can have a more complex interface than if you're just taking a cab, right? So it's like uh, you have to think about um, how much work that the user has to do and whether it's worth it to them to do that. There's also some more subtle things like tone of voice. So uh, part of UX is actually writing content. So how many of you here like write text that the user is going to see on the site? Like you're writing button text or labels or, yeah, sometimes this gets left up to us as front end developers. <laughs> and it's like, oh, nobody thought about this. So this isn't really part of my job description, but I'm writing the, the user interface text because nobody thought to do it. 
Um, and the tone of voice there is really important. So ideally on your site, you'd actually have a style guide to define this, but if you don't, um, you have to think back to those personas and those key, key audiences who are gonna be interacting with this. Um, and then, yeah, does the site have a connection with, with these personas? Sometimes that's um, harder to measure. It's more of like a, a, the visual experience. Do they feel like they like they like this website, and then success and failure, like can someone actually do what they need to do? So as you're thinking through all these things and assessing the wireframes that you have, um, you, can, you can kind of put your wireframes through this filter to see if you, know, you think that they're doing the job, but at some point it would be nice to do some testing. So. This is supposed to be a video. Oh, nice. Yeah, so you can do testing with wireframes like this. Like you can just show people wireframes and get them to do tasks and ask them what they think. And this is a simple way to get started with testing. And you can do this kind of testing with just a couple users and sometimes realize um, really important things about um, the workflow or the organization of your interface that don't work or could be improved. And once you've built out an actual, inter like a working prototype, either using something like Envision or actually like something people can click through, then you can do user testing where you sit someone in a room, you have them sit at a laptop, and again, you watch them use an interface. And the most important thing here is to listen. So um, one thing that I, I, I train people how to use Drupal, so I like to go and show people how to do things and answer their questions and help them. But when you're doing user testing, it's kind of the opposite. So I'm usually the one, when I do user testing, you know, sitting there taking notes, um, and it's um, <laughs> because, because I, I have a hard time just listening and watching somebody um, because I want to help them. Um, so it's really important to, to listen, to see what people focus on, um, and to just pay attention to their pain points. That's what you're trying to figure out. What, what are things that are, are challenging when somebody's using an interface? Um, and when you're doing uh, user testing, the User testing, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot of users. You can go and do user testing with five users. You can bring them into your office one by one and just sit them down. Um, or you can do this online. You can use video conferences and, you know, record the sessions and ask the users to, to do the tasks. And, um, and that works really well, too. Um, you don't need a ton of users uh, to find the most important pain points and the most important things that work well. Um, so what takes a long time is not so much for doing the user testing, it's taking all of that feedback and turning it into something useful for the team to iterate on. So um, don't underestimate the amount of time it's gonna take you after you do the user testing. So for some of our projects, we have time to do user experience work like I've been describing. And for some of our projects, we don't. So some projects, the timeline's too tight or you know, we just don't have the, um, th there's just a, a list of things we have to get done and UX just gets always pushed to the bottom. Um, or we get brought into the process too late. And I think this is one thing that often is front-end developers, we struggle with, right? And it's nobody's job to do the UX. It ends up being our job, but we don't have enough time to actually do it. So one project that we've um, kind of started at, Evo at Evolving Web at my company is we run UX events. And the format of this, I think you could, you could, do, um, you could do anywhere. You could take this and run with it. Basically, we have a few projects um, people present prototypes or working demos of, of websites or apps or um, whatever they're working on. And we get a group of people together. And after the presentation, could be a, a three-minute presentation where you're just showing um, one part of an interface that you're having trouble figuring out. And the group goes around and gives their first impressions 
they give positive feedback, what they think works well, and then they talk about, um, and then they give uh, critical feedback, things that they think could be better, things that look like they could be improved. And it's kind of like doing user testing in a group. So you don't get quite the same um, uh, level of, of detail as when you have somebody using the interface sitting next to you. But you get a pretty good uh, feel for these first impressions and what people are thinking of, of the interface. And even just going and taking your project and putting it up on a big screen and showing a bunch of people, you probably realize yourself a lot of the pain points that people have. Um, so this has been really useful for us as, uh, as a UX um, tool, and so we use it we use it as one of the many things in our toolkit. Um, and I think what works well about this process is that it involves listening. So what we, the way it works when I've done presentations is present for a few minutes, listen to everybody's feedback, and not respond to them and say, oh yeah, but you don't understand the, UI, the, <laughs> the prototype is supposed to do this. You have to just listen to the feedback and take it in and write it down and you know, kind of reflect. Um, so if, if anyone's interested in implementing something like this, let me know if, you ha if you're interested after and I can tell you all about it. So I know some of you here are um, looking for a toolkit like what are the actual tools? <laughs> what is the technology? Because we're all technologists and we like tools and you're all getting out your phones and taking a picture of the list. This is not a complete list, it's just a few tools. Um, there's so many tools out there for UX now, like it's exploded. I could probably put all the logos and it would be like a crowded screen of logos. Um, so there's lots of tools out there. Prototyping tools, um, you can pick whichever one. Um, uh, Envision is what we'd use, but there's obviously other things just like it. Um, Axer is up there, that's, or at, Azure, Axer, that's, that allows you to do a little bit more interactive prototyping. Um, Figma is a design tool that's actually used for developing designs for Drupal. So if you're interested in getting involved in the Drupal UX process, um, that's a cool one. And then in general, you know, use, use the Google tools, use whatever you need to for running online tests. You can even just use something like Zoom to do video conferences and record them. So the simpler, the better in terms of your tool set. Um, don't try and get too complicated. Um, don't let the tools weigh you down. That would be my advice there. So takeaways, you wanna empathize with your users. You wanna get in there and get some, some information about the project when you're starting the front end development process. Um, and you wanna do a mix of quantitative and qualitative research. Qualitative research is better for convincing stakeholders, sorry, quantitative research. It's easier to convince stakeholders when you have numbers, but qualitative research is gonna give you a better feel for the actual purpose of the project and help you make decisions um, more quickly. Also, quick note, who is gonna be here tomorrow? I know you are all into UX now, so I, I see you with your hands up there. <laughs> um, we're doing some work on the UX of Drupal, so if you wanna come help out with that, come to the admin UI table. Um, we would love to have you. And if you just wanna get involved in some user testing just to see how that works as either a tester or, a, or, or like someone doing the test, being the test subject, um, you can sign up for that UX study and um, see how that works. And also I encourage you to give feedback on DrupalCon and this session at the URL, but that, that's gonna be sent to you in an email like a whole bunch of times. So just at some point, click on it and fill it in, please. It would be very helpful. Thank you very much. <laughs> and as promised, I think I have 90 sec seconds for questions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So 
That's a really good question. So the question is, uh, how do you communicate to front-end developers about the UX research that's already been done? Um, I'd say, like, don't, under, don't underestimate a front-end developer. Like, they can understand the results, but they're not going to probably have time to go and wade through, like, a spreadsheet where you've done testing with uh, 20 people and there's notes. Um, so having some kind of an overview where you're telling them about the personas and kind of consolidating that information, like, like what, are the, um, what are the key calls to action, what are the users actually trying to achieve, um, that would be useful. Having that site map with the user journeys mapped onto it, I think that that would be a really nice outcome for front-end devs. Um, and then maybe even just to have some examples. So um, that might involve some like training for them um, from your perspective of like what, what are the most important things to look at in terms of the um, basic like personas and site map, and then how does that translate into a good UI? But yeah, hard, hard problem to solve, for sure. <laughs> Anything else? Well, we have the room. Okay, well, if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, I'd love to chat more about this. So thanks.